Hello and welcome to Oak Island Theories. In this video, we are going to explore the theory that members of a Freemasonic fraternity are behind the Oak Island mystery. Let's take a look. Some Oak Island researchers believe that the treasure of the Knights Templar was brought to Oak Island not in the early 1300s by outlawed Templars, nor in the late 1300s by Henry Sinclair, nor in the 1600s by Rosicrucians, but rather sometime in the 1700s by the Knights Templar's supposed successors, the Freemasons. Arguably no organization in the modern Western world, excepting perhaps the Bavarian Illuminati, has engendered more suspicion and given rise to more conspiracy theories than the various lodges, rites, and dependent bodies which fall under the wide umbrella of Freemasonry. Freemasons have been suspected of everything from performing secret satanic rituals, to fomenting the American and French revolutions, to producing the notorious 19th century English serial killer Jack the Ripper, to ultimately trying to take over the world. With so many different legends, theories, and myths surrounding Freemasonry, it can be hard to separate fact from fiction. Who really are the Freemasons? Why do some people think they can trace their origins back to the Knights Templar? And what evidence do we have to suggest they buried Templar treasure on Oak Island? In order to come to a better understanding of Freemasonry, we must first understand something of its history. Both professional historians and Freemasons alike generally agree that modern Freemasonry can trace its origins back to the medieval Scottish, English, and French stonemason guilds. Medieval guilds were organizations composed of generally middle-class men of a similar trade who banded together for mutual aid and protection. There were two main types of medieval guilds in Europe, merchant guilds and craft guilds. Merchant guilds were formed in order to combat the sometimes excessive taxes on goods levied by feudal lords and to ensure protection against bandits and highwaymen, who made their living preying on lone travelers. Craft guilds, on the other hand, were formed by tradesmen who specialized in particular industries, like carpentry, painting, tailoring, cordwainery, baking, and stonemasonry. These craft guilds harbored jealously guarded trade secrets, which ensured their monopolies over whatever industries they specialized in. Medieval stone masonry guilds, like many other craft guilds at the time, were egalitarian meritocracies in which members were ranked based on their skills and experience as opposed to their birth or class backgrounds. Like modern-day tradesmen and their contemporary guildsmen, medieval stonemasons adopted a three-part hierarchy. At the bottom of the hierarchy were the entered apprentices, young, inexperienced masons who worked under the supervision of a master. Next in line were fellows of the craft, or journeymen. Masons who had completed their apprenticeships and were fully educated in the Masonic trade, but had yet to become masters. At the top of the hierarchy were the Master Masons, skilled and seasoned craftsmen who had presented a satisfactory masterpiece, for example a stone gargoyle sculpture, along with a sum of money to other Master Masons in the guild. Each strata in the Masonic hierarchy had its own secret handshake, which Masons used to prove their rank upon entering a new guild. Members of the Masonic guilds of medieval Europe were highly sought after by kings and bishops, due to their valuable and carefully guarded secrets. These secrets included a knowledge of mathematics and geometry, as well as practical tried and true methods of quarrying, shaping and dressing stone, architecture, engineering, and stone carving. With their secret knowledge and skills, the stonemasons of the Middle Ages built towering castles and spectacular Gothic cathedrals like Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris and Westminster Abbey in London, all throughout Europe. Their special skills and knowledge put them in such high demand that they were free to travel throughout Christendom to look for work, thus earning them the name Free Masons. According to legend, when the Knights Templar were arrested in France on October 13, 1307, on the orders of King Philip IV, a number of French Templars escaped the country and fled to Scotland, along with the order's most valuable treasures. There, they found refuge in the lodge of one of the local stonemason guilds. Out of gratitude towards their benefactors, the outlawed knights revealed the nature of their treasure to the masons and taught them their secret initiation ceremonies. The Templars eventually assimilated into the guild, and the guild adopted their secret rites as their own. 
The question of whether or not the last French Templars were absorbed into a Scottish stonemason guild is hotly contested by historians. However, it is widely accepted that another subgroup of Scottish society slowly began to infiltrate Masonic lodges after the Middle Ages, during the Renaissance. Starting in the early 1500s, open-minded Scottish gentlemen and nobles began to associate with the rough, low-born tradesmen of the Masonic guilds. Many of them were attracted to the guild's mystery. With the advent of the printing press, the trade secrets of the Masonic guilds gradually became public knowledge. The secret initiation ceremonies for entered apprentices, fellows of the craft, and master masons, however, remained secret, shrouding the Masonic guilds in an aura of mystery and romance, which many European noblemen found irresistible. These aristocrats wanted to bask in the glory of the prestigious craftsmen known to be privy to secret knowledge, and the Masons were more than happy to accept these wealthy and cultured apprentices into their circles. Another aspect of the Masonic guilds which was hugely appealing to Scottish gentlemen was the fact that all guild members, regardless of social standing, ethnic background, and, perhaps most importantly, political or religious bent, were more or less considered equal. All throughout the Renaissance, the British Isles were plagued by bloody civil wars between Catholics and Protestants. For Scottish gentlemen, it was refreshing to enter into a fraternity in which their political leanings and religious persuasions were largely ignored. Hard on the heels of the religious wars of the Renaissance came the Age of Enlightenment, a period characterized by the concept that reason is a legitimate means by which to define and identify truth, in addition to, or sometimes as opposed to, divine revelation and church doctrine. During this period, free-thinking intellectuals, scientists, and artists of aristocratic stock discovered that inside Masonic circles, they could openly share and discuss their various theories and ideas without fear of condemnation. These gentlemen signed up as apprentices to the Masonic guilds en masse, and the old hand stonemasons, relishing in the prestige, cultured conversation, fine food, and quality alcohol that followed, happily accepted these new initiates. In time, the gentlemen of the Masonic lodges began to outnumber the skilled laborers, and the focus of lodge meetings gradually shifted from actual masonry work to philosophical discussion. Some of these early gentlemen masons included artists, scientists, and politicians, such as Sir Isaac Newton, Voltaire, Mozart, Franz Joseph Haydn, John Locke, Edward Jenner, Napoleon Bonaparte, and Robbie Burns. These gentlemen-dominated Masonic lodges soon became discontented with the guild's casual meetings in alehouses and coffeehouses. They desired more structure, and eventually one of these lodges took action. In 1717, the first Grand Lodge was established in London, England. The Lodge's founders announced that the Grand Lodge alone claimed the exclusive right to establish new Masonic Lodges in England. English Masons outside London took umbrage to this decree, and established the Grand Lodge of all England in the city of York. In 1736, Scottish Masons hopped on the bandwagon by forming the Grand Lodge of St. John in Scotland. And in 1751, a group of Irish-born Londoners followed suit by forming the ancient Grand Lodge. Although Freemasonry certainly had its infancy in Scotland and its coming of age in England, it quickly spread to France and to the British colonies in North America. Many of the ideals espoused by Freemasonry, such as freedom of thought, equality, and brotherhood, spilled over into politics. In the Americas, Masonic colonists, dissatisfied with British rule, were foremost among those who ultimately started the American Revolution. Of the 56 American colonists who signed the Declaration of Independence, nine were Freemasons. Some of the most prominent of these American Freemasons, including George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, and Paul Revere, are now considered to be founding fathers of the United States of America. Shortly after the American Revolution, the people of France became dissatisfied with the ruling Capetian regime, and similarly deposed it. In the bloody reign of terror that ensued, French revolutionaries rallied to the cry of Liberté, Égalité, Fraternité, or Freedom, Equality, and Brotherhood, three core tenets of Freemasonic ideology. Freemasonry thrived in the 1700s and expanded throughout most of the 1800s. A number of books painting Freemasonry in a negative light were published in the 19th century, however, and soon anti-Masonic sentiment abounded. During this time, 
a myriad of conspiracy theories surrounding Freemasonry were born, many of which survive to this day. One of the most enduring theories is that the Freemasons are the successors of the Knights Templar. One offshoot of this theory is that Freemasons came to Oak Island sometime in the 1700s to bury the legendary Templar treasure. Proponents of this theory generally agree that if Freemasons did indeed bury something on Oak Island, it would likely be the legendary lost treasure of the Knights Templar. This treasure is said to include the Ark of the Covenant, the Golden Menorah, and other priceless religious artifacts such as the Holy Grail and the Lance of Longinus. According to Masonic teachings, one of the most valuable treasures of the Temple of Solomon, and subsequently of the Knights Templar, is a golden triangle called the Delta of Enoch, on which is inscribed the ineffable name of God. According to the Book of Genesis, Enoch was a virtuous man beloved by God. The Old Testament asserts that he was the great-grandfather of Noah, the man who built the legendary ark which housed Noah himself, his wife and three sons, his three granddaughters-in-law, and mating pairs of all the world's animals during the Great Flood. According to Jewish and Masonic legend, Enoch had a dream in which God revealed his true name to him on a mountaintop and forbade him to repeat it to anyone. Then God transported him underground, through nine arches, to a subterranean vault where he found the name of God engraved on a triangular plate of solid gold. When he awoke, Enoch interpreted his dream as a sign to construct the chambers he had seen. He immediately set about excavating the first eight subterranean chambers, which were meant for protection, underneath a mountain called Mount Moriah. In the ninth and final chamber, he built a pedestal and placed upon it a triangle of pure gold, on which was written the unutterable name of God. When he had completed the chambers, Enoch marked the place where they were buried with a crude temple, which he built from unhewn stones. Mount Moriah, the anglicized interpretation of the ancient Hebrew name Har Habayit, was the holy mountain where, generations after Enoch and his son Noah, Abraham prepared an altar on which to sacrifice his son Isaac. According to the book of Genesis, God, in order to test Abraham's loyalty, commanded him to offer up his son Isaac as a sacrifice. Abraham conceded to God's demand and set about preparing an altar on Mount Moriah. When that was done, he led Isaac to the mountaintop, bound him to the altar, and prepared to slaughter him. His hand was stayed at the last moment by an angel, who informed him that the whole scenario was a test of loyalty. At that moment, Abraham spotted a ram which had caught its horns in some nearby bushes and, out of gratitude to God, sacrificed it on the altar instead of his son. Centuries later, a Jebusite, or Canaanite tribesman, named Arauna built a threshing floor on Mount Moriah. A threshing floor is a stone floor on which grain is trampled underfoot in order to separate the stalks from the husks. King David, the second king of the United Kingdom of Israel, purchased this threshing floor from Arauna and converted it into an altar. Later, David's son Solomon constructed his famous first temple of Jerusalem on the site of the altar. While Solomon's builders were constructing the temple foundation, they discovered the Enochian chambers and the Delta of Enoch. When the temple was completed, the Delta was placed in its treasury. Legend has it that, 11,000 years later, in the aftermath of the First Crusade, the Delta of Enoch was recovered by the Knights Templar. More than 200 years after that, it was brought to Oak Island and buried by Freemasons. Researchers who believe the Freemasons may have buried treasure on Oak Island almost always subscribe to the theory that the Freemasons are the successors of the Knights Templar. According to some legends, the Knights Templar kept their most valuable treasures secret in order to mitigate the risk of them coming into the possession of the wrong sorts of people. If the early Freemasons were truly the successors of the Knights Templar and the heirs of a treasure of incalculable historic and religious significance, it stands to reason that they would have followed in the Templars' footsteps and sought to keep the treasure hidden. For this reason, some believe they buried the treasure on Oak Island. The theory that the booby-trapped money pit is the handiwork of the Freemasons hinges on the alleged connection between Freemasonry and the Knights Templar. Evidence to back up this supposed connection generally consists of similarities between Templar and Masonic symbolism, archaeological findings, anecdotes, and folk legends. Some of the most touted supposed connections between Freemasonry and the Knights Templar have to do with the Temple of Solomon. 
it is well documented that the poor fellow soldiers of Jesus Christ established their first headquarters inside the Al-Aqsa Mosque on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, which, according to Jewish tradition, was the site where Solomon's temple once stood. The poor fellow soldiers were so enamored with the legendary history of their first headquarters that they renamed themselves the Knights of the Temple, or the Knights Templar. Freemasonic symbolism also draws heavily on the legendary history of Solomon's Temple. In fact, Freemasonry traces its mythical, if not historic, origins back to Hiram Abiff, the legendary chief architect who oversaw the construction of the temple in around 1000 BC. The story goes that Hiram Abiff had a habit of briefly leaving the worksite once a day to pray. One day, as he was leaving the worksite for this very purpose, he was accosted by three journeyman stonemasons who demanded that he reveal to them the secrets of the master masons. When Hiram Abiff refused to divulge the secrets, the journeymen struck him with the tools they were carrying and killed him. Thus, Hiram Abiff took the secrets of the Master Masons with him to the grave. This legend of Hiram Abiff plays an integral role in the secret Masonic second degree initiation ceremony, in which entered apprentices transition into fellow craftsmen. Another connection between Freemasonry and Solomon's Temple is the layout and furnishings of the Masonic Lodges. Masonic lodges are usually rectangular in shape and are oriented from east to west, as Solomon's temple is said to have been. The lodges are also furnished with two pillars tipped with globes. These pillars represent the two copper, brass, or bronze columns which were said to have flanked the main entrance of Solomon's temple. Other evidence supposedly connecting Freemasonry with the Knights Templar are the stone carvings inside Roslyn Chapel in Scotland. Many of the chapel's intricate stone carvings appear to depict Templar symbols, like the two riders on a single horse and the Agnus Dei. One carving in particular appears to brazenly illustrate a connection between the secret adubment and ordination ceremony of the Templar Knights and the secret initiation rites of the Freemasons. This weather-worn carving, some argue, depicts two figures, one a bearded knight wearing a Templar mantle, and the other a clean-shaven, blindfolded initiate holding the Holy Bible. The initiate, who is apparently kneeling between two pillars, has a noose around his neck, the other end of which is held by the Templar Knights. If this carving truly depicts the secret Templar initiation ceremony, then a convincing argument can be made that Freemasonry might owe at least some of its heritage to the Knights Templar. In the strange Freemasonic first, second, and third degree initiation ceremonies, initiates are blindfolded, have a length of rope, called a cable tow, draped around their necks, and are led to the door of the lodge by a master mason, who is holding the other end of the rope. One of the most famous symbols of Freemasonry is the immaculate white apron which every entered apprentice receives during his initiation ceremony. This item represents the heavy aprons worn by medieval stonemasons which protected their clothing from stone dust. Traditionally, Freemasonic aprons are made from white lambskin, a symbol of purity and virtue. Some argue that certain qualities of the Masonic apron indicate a connection with the Knights Templar. It is known that Templar Knights wore white sheepskin belts around their waists, symbolizing their vows of chastity. If the last of the Templars were truly absorbed by a medieval stonemason guild, Perhaps their custom of wearing a sheepskin belt evolved into the Freemasonic custom of wearing a white sheepskin apron. Two of the most important symbols in Freemasonry are the square and compass. Together, along with the letter G, they make up the iconic Masonic Jewel, an internationally recognized symbol of Freemasonry. Some Freemasons see the square as a symbol of honesty, fairness, and virtue and the compass as a representation of friendship, morality, and brotherly love. In the 1960s, Dan Blankenship and David Tobias of Triton Alliance discovered a metal mason square near the supposed finger drains in Smith's Cove. Metallurgists analyzed the square and dated it to before 1783. Some believe this artifact to be another piece of evidence indicating a Masonic presence on Oak Island, apparently suspecting that the tool was deliberately left at Smith's Cove as a sort of Masonic signature. Others counter this argument by pointing out that squares were almost certainly employed by the architecturally savvy constructors of the Smith's Cove Flood Tunnel, whether they were Freemasons or not. This counter-argument is perhaps best summarized by author Randall Sullivan in his book The Curse of Oak Island, in a scathing critique of an article written by Oak Island skeptic Joe Nickel. Quote, Indeed, the square is one of the major symbols of Freemasonry, 
Nickel had observed. It's also a common tool that's used by virtually everyone involved in mechanical engineering and technical drawing, and was almost certainly left on Oak Island by a number of one of the early search companies." Unquote. Although none of the lodges, rites, and appendant bodies of Freemasonry officially claim to be the successors of the Knights Templar, some of the titles of Masonic officers and degrees seem to suggest some sort of connection between the two secret organizations. The heads of Masonic lodges are called Grand Masters a title historically reserved for internationally renowned chess champions, the most senior practitioners of ancient Chinese, Japanese, and Korean martial arts, and the heads of medieval monastic military orders, such as the Knights Hospitaller, the Teutonic Order, and the Knights Templar. Other alleged connections between Freemasonry and the Knights Templar are less subtle. One of the appendant bodies of Freemasonry is actually called the Knights Templar. Another organization associated with Freemasonry is the Order of Domolay, a Masonic fraternity for young men named after the last Grand Master of the Knights Templar, Jacques de Molay. Another piece of supposed evidence linking the Knights Templar with Freemasonry is the legend of the skull and crossbones. This legend has its roots in the execution of Grand Master Jacques de Molay on March 18, 1318. Before he was emulated for heresy, de Molay allegedly cursed both Pope Clement V and King Philip IV and his descendants declaring that the two men would answer to God for their crimes against the Knights Templar within the year. Eerily, before the year was out, Pope Clement succumbed to a gastrointestinal malady, and the 46-year-old King Philip died from a stroke he sustained while on a hunting trip. None of King Philip's three sons were able to sire heirs, and thus the 300-year-old House of Capet died with them. According to legend, several French Templar knights who had gone into hiding approached Amolet's pyre long after the embers had cooled. All that remained of their Grand Master was his skull and femurs. From that time on, the underground, outlawed Templars adopted the skull and crossed femurs as one of their symbols. Throughout the years, the symbol of the skull and crossbones has served a variety of different functions. It has long been used to mark containers containing toxic substances. It has also been used for centuries as a memento mori, a reminder of her own mortality, engraved on tombstones and on the entrances to cemeteries. During the Golden Age of Piracy, it found its way onto the Black Field of the Jolly Roger, a standard famously flown by pirates like Black Sam Bellamy and Edward Blackbeard Teach. It also morphed into the Totemkopf, the Death's Head image historically used by regiments of the German military from the Hussars of the 18th and 19th century Kingdom of Prussia to the infamous SS of the Third Reich. The skull and crossbones is also an important symbol for Freemasons. It is frequently used in conjunction with other Masonic symbols, like the Twin Pillars, the Square and Compass, and the Trowel. In addition, it is the official logo of Skull and Bones, a secret society at Yale University with suspected ties to Freemasonry and the CIA. Some take this fact coupled with the Templar legend of the skull and crossbones, as another piece of evidence affirming that the Freemasons are indeed the successors of the Knights Templar. There is another legend associated with the execution of Grand Master Jacques de Molay, which reveals an apparent connection between Freemasonry and the Knights Templar. As mentioned earlier, legend has it that Jacques de Molay, before he was burned at the stake, cursed both Pope Clement V and King Philip of France and his descendants. Before the year was out, both the Pope and the King were dead. King Philip IV's sons were unable to sire heirs, and so the Capetian royal family died with them. And thus Jacques de Molay's curse was satisfied. Or was it? After the death of the last of Philip's sons, a war for succession between the House of Plantagenet and the House of Valois, known as the Hundred Years' War, began. The claimant to the throne from the House of Valois was King Philip VI, the nephew of Philip IV. After a century of fighting, the descendants of Philip VI retained the French throne, and thus the Capetian dynasty continued to survive and thrive. The House of Valois ruled France for more than 200 years before dying out in the late 1500s. It was succeeded by the House of Bourbon, another branch of the Capetian line. Under the House of Bourbon, the Capetian dynasty continued to rule France for another 200 years. In the mid-late 1700s, in the midst of an economic depression and a serious national food crisis, the French people revolted against their aristocracy in what has come to be known as the French Revolution. On January 21, 1793, 
King Louis XVI of France was beheaded by the French National Assembly via guillotine. According to an old French legend, when Louis XVI was decapitated, one among the huge crowd of onlookers who would come to witness the king's execution cried, Jacques de Molay, thou art avenged. True or not, the guillotine blade that fell that day brought an end not only to the French monarch, but also to the 800-year-old Capetian dynasty of which he was a part, at least until the Bourbon Restoration of 1814. With that in mind, some believe that this legend, in conjunction with the long-held theory that Freemasonry, or at the very least Freemasonic ideals, was at the heart of the French Revolution, is evidence that the Knights Templar, following its oppression in the early 1300s, survived underground as Freemasonry. Even if there is a possibility that Freemasonry can trace part of its origins back to the Knights Templar, what evidence is there to suggest that Freemasons buried the Templar treasure on Oak Island? Some believe that various artifacts recovered by treasure hunters on the Nova Scotian island hint at a Freemasonic connection. If the Kempton symbols are genuine, one of the characters inscribed on the 90-foot stone is a dot within a circle, or a circumpunct, the symbol of the entered apprentice of Freemasonry. Another circumpunct engraving was found on Oak Island in 1936 by Oak Island treasure hunter Gilbert Hedden. The boulder on which the circumpunct was engraved was discovered in Jowdry's Cove. Unfortunately, this stone was later obliterated by treasure hunters, who suspected something might be buried beneath it. Some believe that the construction of the money pit itself suggests a Masonic connection. Proponents of this theory argue that the layer of flat stones discovered by Daniel McGuinness, Anthony Vaughan, and John Smith near the surface of the money pit in 1795 was meant to represent both a threshing floor and the unhewn stones Enoch used to mark the site of his chambers. A threshing floor is a typically circular, paved surface on which, in the millennia preceding the invention of a threshing machine, sheaves of wheat were trampled underfoot in order to separate the husks from the stalks. In both the Old and New Testaments, the threshing floor is frequently used as a metaphor for divine judgment. The second book of Samuel maintains that a Jebusite named Arauna built a threshing floor on Mount Moriah, the holy mountain on which Abraham once prepared an altar on which to sacrifice his son Isaac. King David, the second king of the United Kingdom of Israel, purchased this threshing floor from Arauna and converted it into an altar to God. Later, David's son Solomon constructed his famous first temple of Jerusalem on the site of the threshing floor slash altar. Some believe that the supposed presence of a threshing floor on Oak Island is evidence of Freemasonic involvement, maintaining that the threshing floor is a symbol of Solomon's temple, which in turn is an important symbol of both the Knights Templar and Freemasonry. Some Oak Island researchers believe that the story of the money pit bears an uncanny resemblance to the Freemasonic legend of Enoch. According to this legend, Enoch, acting on a divine revelation he received in a dream, constructed nine subterranean chambers beneath Mount Moriah. The first eight chambers were built for protection, but in the ninth chamber he interred a fantastic treasure, the golden delta on which was inscribed the ineffable name of God. When he had finished building the chambers, he marked them on the surface with a modest temple crafted from unhewn stones. Centuries later, King Solomon had his famous temple built on Mount Moriah, which would thereafter be known as the Temple Mount. During the construction of the temple's foundation, Master Mason Adoniram, along with two assistants, discovered the Enochian chambers. They dug through all eight chambers and finally uncovered the Golden Triangle, the Delta of Enoch. This triangle eventually became one of the most valuable items in the vast treasury of King Solomon. In the initiation ceremony of the Scottish Rite's 13th degree, the Scottish Rite being a division of Freemasonry founded in the 18th century by Scottish expatriates known as Jacobites, is a reenactment of the legendary discovery of the Enochian Chambers. This 13th degree of the Scottish Rite is also known as the Royal Ark of Solomon and the Royal Ark of Enoch. Some researchers believe that the Money Pit is a Masonic recreation of the Enochian Chambers. Like the Chambers, the Money Pit was marked by unhewn stones, first discovered by three men, and has nine chambers. Another Enochian symbol on Oak Island is the rock with an iron ring embedded in it, allegedly found below the high tide line in Smith's Cove by early Oak Island excavators. According to Masonic teachings, the door to the Enochian chambers is a stone with an iron ring. Besides the money pit, there are other artifacts discovered by treasure hunters over the years which seem to suggest that there was once a Masonic presence on Oak Island. 
In 1967, Oak Island treasure hunter Dan Blankenship discovered a large boulder with the letter G carved into it. The letter G is one of the most important symbols of Freemasonry, symbolizing both God, the grand architect of the universe, and geometry, the science which was once one of the most carefully guarded secrets of the medieval Masonic guilds. The letter G is one of the three elements of the iconic Masonic jewel, along with the square and compass. In the same year that he discovered the boulder with the letter G, Blankenship also discovered a heart-shaped stone in Smith's Cove, which appeared to bear tool marks as if it had been deliberately crafted into that shape. Writer and Oak Island researcher Mark Finnan has suggested that this heart-shaped stone alludes to the naked heart and sword, a Masonic symbol of justice which plays an important role in the entered apprentice degree of Freemasonry. Another apparent Masonic symbol on Oak Island is the equilateral stone triangle, originally discovered by Captain Welling and Fred Blair in 1897, and later rediscovered by Gilbert Hedden in 1937. The equilateral triangle is an important Masonic symbol. The universal Masonic symbol for God, the great architect of the universe, is the all-seeing eye, enclosed in an equilateral triangle. Unfortunately, the stone triangle was destroyed in the 1960s during the excavations of treasure hunter Robert Dunfield. In Season 4, Episode 2 of The Curse of Oak Island, Tony Sampson discovered a rock in a water well at New Ross, Nova Scotia, bearing what he suggested might be the image of the all-seeing eye, a prominent symbol of Freemasonry. In Season 5, Episodes 5 and 6, two human bones were discovered in the spoils of Borehole H8. These bones were later determined to have come from two individuals of European and Middle Eastern extraction, respectively. In Season 5, Episode 8, the European bone was carbon dated from 1678 to 1764, while the Middle Eastern bone was carbon dated from 1682 to 1736. Both of these date ranges are consistent with the Freemason theory. In Season 5, Episode 16, Gary Drayton discovered a rhodolite garnet brooch on Oak Island's Lot 8. In the Season 5 finale, an unnamed gemologist determined that the artifact was crafted in the 16th or 17th century, a time frame which roughly corresponds with the Freemason theory. In Season 6, Episode 7, astrophysicist and aerospace engineer Dr. Travis Taylor developed an Oak Island star map based on an important Freemasonic symbol called the First Degree Masonic Tracing Board. In a subsequent investigation, Marty Lagina discovered large boulders near the areas of interest indicated by the star map. In Season 6, Episode 21, researcher Chris Dona put forth his theory which revolves around another star map he constructed based on Freemasonic symbolism. Do you think that Freemasonry has something to do with the Oak Island mystery? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video and would like to support this channel, please check out the Oak Island Encyclopedia by clicking the link in the description.